So we have our stripped down dual process theory. We need to evaluate evidence for and against it. Let's start with the evidence for. But first of all, why are we doing this? Well, we have a loose reconstruction of Green's argument, which has some quite dramatic implications for ethics. Um, a lot of ethics relies on not justified inferentially premises. And this argument, if it's correct, shows that one can't do that insofar as the aim is to establish knowledge of a conclusion. Given that that has quite far reaching uh, implications, we ought to consider objections to the argument here. What I've already suggested to you in a previous section is that the quick objections to this loose reconstruction do not seem to work. So if there was a quick objection, that would be good because we could knock down the argument without a massive amount of work and move on. But my suggestion to you is that I can't find a quick objection. I'm looking forward to see if you can find one. In the meanwhile, I'm prepared to consider a more onerous objection. And I think of the argument's various premises, the one where we're most likely to find an objection is actually the first premise, which is the claim that there is a dual process theory of moral psychology. That's then why we're interested in the evidence for the dual process theory and later in the evidence against it. We want to see if there's a way to challenge this first premise and so to avoid the dramatic implications that this argument has for ethics. Now, in all of these lectures, on the dual process theory, we're just following a single paper by Green, uh, the point and shoot paper. Now, Green has written other papers more recently, which offer interesting elaborations and clarifications, but none of those are absolutely essential for our purposes. Uh, so it's simple for us just to stick to this one paper. Now, in that 2014 paper, Green actually cites lots and lots and lots of research. To my mind, not all of the research he cites is particularly convincing. It may not provide very compelling reasons to accept the dual process theory of moral psychology. So what I've done is selected what I take to be some of the most compelling evidence, but I've also done so with an eye to illustrating the limits of some of the evidence as well. So I'm not saying that this sequence of three studies is actually the absolute best you can get out of the paper, but I think it's very close. And I think looking at these three studies in a bit more detail, will help us to see some of the strengths and weaknesses of the evidence available. So let's make a start with Suter and Hertwig. And what you'll notice is that at the beginning of the course, I did kind of walk you through fairly slowly the process of evaluating evidence. Now I'm just giving you the bare outline and supposing that if this is critical for you, you're going to do the deeper evaluation. So what are Suter, Suter and Hertwig predicting? Well, we want to make sure their prediction aligns with our stripped down dual process theory. Here it is. Uh, not a perfect picture, but it will do. The idea is that we've got two or more processes and those processes differ in how various contextual factors like time pressure and cognitive load, scenario complexity and the rest influence the processes. So for example, Sutra and Hertwig are manipulating time pressure and we think that one of these processes will be more impaired by time pressure than the other. And so what happens is as we increase time pressure, we see greater influence of the fast process and less influence of the slow process. That's what our dual process theory is telling us. Now, from that alone, it's very difficult for us to generate a prediction. So we need an auxiliary hypothesis. And what you remember when we were looking at the auxiliary hypotheses in that section earlier in today's lecture is that we actually have a choice here. So Green brings a kind of a whole bag of auxiliary hypotheses with him. You know, it's, uh, it's full of snakes, actually. Um, and they're all kind of writhing around. And it's great. It's loads of fun. But we don't need the complexity of that bag of snakes. I guess I'm thinking of a can of worms, actually. Whatever it is, there's all kinds of stuff in there. And it, it's a sort of risky business, you know, which is fine if you're Green. Um, but if you're me, you know, you're going to likely, much more likely to get shot down quickly. So you want to take it easy. You want to be cautious. I recommend this. Uh, so what we did was we said, well, which of the hypotheses are the uh, weakest we can have that will still generate the predictions? And although there isn't a unique candidate, I think this is a particularly good one. So I don't think there's a weaker hypothesis that will generate the predictions that will allow us to relate the theory to the available evidence and also to new evidence. So here's the hypothesis we've settled on. Only the slow process ever flexibly and rapidly takes into account differences in the more distal outcomes of an action. Uh, more distal, I realize I explained this in the notes, but not in the recordings. Uh, so the idea is this, um, suppose that you have an action whereby uh, you kick a football and it smashes a window and it 
kills somebody who then keels over and stops a tram from running over 5,000 people in a football stadium. Uh, so what have you done there? Well, you kicked a football, that's the most proximal thing, but that in turn caused the window to break. So relative to kicking, the breaking of the window is a more distal outcome. But of course, breaking the window allowed the football to go through it and, and kill the person. Right? So now you can think of killing the person as even more distal. That's further away with respect to the partial ordering implied by the means end relation than the kicking is. So we've got kicking here and killing there. But of course, that killing ultimately results in saving 5,000 people as you stop the box car and so on. So the even more distant outcome is the saving of the 5,000 people. The auxiliary hypothesis says that as you get more distal, it's less likely, in effect, that your fast process will take it into account, although the slow process will still be, will still be interested, will still be up for it. Uh, so the slow process may over lots of time adjust itself if things have very predictable distal outcomes. But where the outcomes are less predictable from your past history, so there's a need for greater flexibility in predicting them, it's going to be down to the slow process to adapt to them. What a brilliant hypothesis. Uh, but is it true? Well, we can derive a prediction from it, and it's the very prediction that Suter and Hetvig are testing. If we limit the time available to you to make a decision, then we should reduce the influence of the slow process on your response, and therefore we should reduce the influence of the distal outcomes, so the prediction. Now I've already mentioned this study, um, but it's nice to see it linked explicitly to our auxiliary hypothesis. So here's their study. We're mainly interested in these high conflict dilemmas. So these are dilemmas where you're killing one person to save five, for example. Uh, so you're doing something which conflicts with a rule. And what we find here is that when you uh, have as much time as you want, you tend to be a bit more utilitarian or less deontological, they don't distinguish those two things, compared to when you have to go fast. So when you have to go fast, you're more likely to say, look, I'm just not going to kill one person to save five than when you're going slow. Uh, than when you're going slow. So that's an interesting result for us because that tends to support the prediction that was made. Um, in what they call low conflict, the killing is presented as a side effect rather than something direct. So the low conflict ones are a bit like the trolley case where you move the box car and so indirectly kill somebody. The high conflict ones are a bit like the footbridge or drop scenario when you have to kill someone uh, in order to save another person. So what they're suggesting is that in these cases where there is a high conflict between what the rules require and what what the good consequences are that you can get, it's as you reduce the amount of time that's available to you, so you also reduce sensitivity to the saving of the five people. That's anyway the conclusion that they're drawing. They say participants in the time pressure condition were more likely to give no responses in the high conflict dilemmas. Uh, so footbridge or drop style dilemmas. All right, now I think this is good. I think this is a nice, relatively simple piece of evidence that supports the dual process theory by confirming one of its predictions. Remember, of course, it's very important here, we're, we're doing something which isn't post hoc. So Sutra and Hertwig set out to test a prediction of the dual process theory, um, and that's just what they did. So it wasn't that they got the results and then worked back post hoc to the dual process theory. So it's actually quite good from that point of view. But I think it could be even better. And the reason it could be even better is that it doesn't involve any variation in the outcomes. It doesn't see, you know, what we really want to see is that how people respond to an action depends on the outcome, more distal outcome, that's to say, of the action. So for example, you know, am I killing one person to save one person or am I killing one person to save five? I've got a variation in the outcome. And what we ought to see is that as we speed things up, we get less sensitivity to the outcomes. Why am I saying that? Well, the auxiliary hypothesis is about the slow process taking into account differences in the more distal outcomes of the action. So in order to show that the process is taking into account those differences is sensitive to what the more distal outcomes is, it seems like we ought to see what happens as we vary the outcomes. Um, and you can see that from the prediction as well. The prediction's about reducing the influence of those distal outcomes. But if we're not changing the outcomes, it's hard for us to be sure that what we've confirmed is that prediction and not something else. 
So I think this is a good piece of evidence as far as it goes, but it would be nice to look at a study. Gosh, I wonder if you've got one lined up next, Steve. You know me too well. Uh, it would be good to look at a study where the outcomes are varied. So once again, this is a study where the time pressure variable is manipulated. So the idea is that as you increase time pressure, you reduce the influence of the slow process and increase the influence of the fast process. Given our auxiliary hypothesis that it's only the slow process which can flexibly and rapidly adjust to information about more distal outcomes of action, we might predict that limiting the time available to make a decision will reduce consequentialist responses, so Tremolier and Bonifon. Um, and actually that's just what they found. So here we're killing one person to save five. When I've got free time, I am about a third of the time, so not terribly often, doing this. Um, when I'm under time pressure, I'm much less happy to do that. That's what they show. But they also vary the outcome. So I could kill one person to say 50, 500 or 5,000. And what you can see here is that as the extreme number of people being saved goes, the effect of time pressure finally vanishes, finally vanishes. So the way that these researchers present this result is in terms of that prediction. So they suggest that what's happening is that limiting the time available to make a decision makes me less sensitive to the outcomes. And their interpretation is that you've got to have like a really, really big difference in outcomes before when I'm under time pressure, I'm actually going to be responsive to that. It's only when the outcome difference is super, super obvious that I can respond to that quickly. Now that is one interpretation of their results for sure. So we are perhaps here taking into account differences under time pressure, uh, when we're not under time pressure, that we're much less sensitive to when we are under time pressure. So Tremolier and Bonifon. But there's another thought here, which is that as you limit the time available to make a decision, you should actually reduce sensitivity to outcomes. So here's another prediction, which is going to give us another way of looking at the data. And if we look at the data that way, we seem to have exactly the opposite. So when time pressure is reduced, the difference between the five case, killing one to say five, and the 5,000 case, killing one to say 5,000, is actually larger than when there's no time pressure. The difference is smaller. So you can kind of look at this data two ways. Tremolier and Bonifon are suggesting we should look at it like this. In order for you to be sensitive to outcomes when there's time pressure, the outcomes have to be pretty dramatic. You've got to be saving 500 or 5,000. Otherwise, your consideration of those outcomes is going to be impaired by time pressure. And that would support the dual process theory. But another way to look at it, suggested by Goronsky and Beer, is that when you put people under time pressure, what you see is that they become more sensitive, not less sensitive to the outcomes. So the prediction was that limiting the time available to make a decision will reduce sensitivity to outcomes. And we actually seem to have the opposite of that here. Now we've got to be very careful because this is post hoc. This is not a prediction that Tremolet and Bonifon set out to test. And if they had done, they wouldn't have designed the experiment in the way they did. So this is all post hoc. and We just want to be very careful. It's just suggestive. But here, what Goronsky and Beer did to make this point is they actually used the same data, but they drew the graphs differently. And this will help you to see their way of looking at the data. So the way they look at it is this. Uh, so in experiment one, the previous graphs collapsed two experiments. So in experiment one, we've got low load versus high load. And what you can see, if you look at the five versus 500, in the low load case, um, there's actually no difference in the proportion of killings. I'm just as likely to kill one as say five as I am to kill one as say 500. In the high load case, that's not true. There's now a significant gap between the two. Uh, and the same thing when you've got time pressure. I'm sorry, this is not super visible on the video, but when you've got unlimited time, uh, there's no significant difference in how likely I am to kill in order to save. Whereas when I'm under time pressure, I'm much more likely to kill one to save 500 than I am to kill one to save just five. Um, so what Goronsky and Beer are saying on the basis of their reinterpretation of Tremolet and Bonifon's data is that actually we're getting the opposite to what we predicted. We predicted that when you limit the time available, you should get less sensitivity to outcomes. What you've actually got is greater sensitivity to outcomes.
Now, as I say, I'm not convinced that that's a very good way to look at the data. It's all a bit post hoc. So I certainly wouldn't want to say that we've clearly disconfirmed a prediction of the dual process theory on the basis of this data. But nor, on the other hand, would I want to cite this data and say this supports the dual process theory. It seems to me now that the case is a bit open. And that's good progress for us in evaluating the evidence. So we haven't actually supported or refuted the theory yet by looking at this evidence, but we have underlined how important it's going to be to see what happens as we vary the distal outcome of actions. Are the cases where we would predict that there should be reduced sensitivity to distal outcomes? And there is. Can we confirm that? Gosh, well, that's a good question. I wonder if Conway and Goronsky could have anything to do with that. These are important researchers for us because they do indeed vary. Uh, they do indeed vary the uh, outcomes. That's very important. They also introduce us to the uh, process dissociation method as well, which I'll explain in a moment. And this is something you can't find in the notes. It's very difficult to explain in words. You're going to have to read their paper if you want to understand process dissociation, or hopefully I can explain to you the minimum that you need to understand. So now we're switching from the time pressure. That was what we were looking at previously. Now we're going to look explicitly at the effects of cognitive load on the two processes. We've got our auxiliary hypothesis. As we increase cognitive load, we think that the responses will be more influenced by the fast process and less influenced by the slow process. So increasing cognitive load is a way of seeing what happens when you kind of, as it were, amplify the effects of the fast process relative to the slow process. What do we predict? Well, we're going to predict that when you increase cognitive load, you're reducing the influence of the slow process, which is the one that's about distal outcomes. So you should reduce the dominance of uh, sensitivity to outcomes. You should get behaviors which are less sensitive to distal outcomes of actions. Now, as I say, to test this, Conway and Goronsky introduced to moral psychology a method which has been terribly important in a wide range of areas, uh, so social cognition and memory in particular, called process dissociation. So this is the idea of process dissociation. Somebody has a moral dilemma. There is some probability that that person will give a utilitarian response and some probability, one minus u, that they will give a non-utilitarian response. But here's the crucial thing. The experiments that we've looked at so far just looked at whether the response was consequentialist or not. And sometimes that was even presented as consequentialist or deontological. But that's a weakness because even if you are not utilitarian, or consequentialist doesn't follow that you're going to be a deontologist, right? You might be neither. You might be a virtue theorist, uh, or you might be a psychopath or something else, right? You might have a, you know, a non-ethical response at all. So if you're not a utilitarian, there's then some probability that you're going to be driven by deontology and some probability that you're not. And that is a possibility. So one of the things that process dissociation allows us to do is to make estimates for these two probabilities, the probability that you will be a consequentialist, the probability that you'll be a deontologist, without the assumption that you must be one or the other, that being one, ex being one is some, it, not being one is a matter of being the other. You might be neither. Uh, so this is a very helpful approach to us. The way it does that is to notice that we have to consider what happens when we vary the outcomes. So what Conway and Goronsky Goronsky call an incongruent dilemma is what you're used to in the uh, trolley or footbridge cases. I'm going to kill one person in order to save five. But look at what happens there. I'm going to kill one person in order to save five. If I'm a consequentialist, I think that's fine. If I follow an injunction not to kill, so I'm thinking deontologically, there's a prohibition on killing, uh, then I shouldn't do that, right? Because killing is wrong. Um, but I might find that harm is acceptable because I'm neither a consequentialist, nor feel any prohibition on killing. Right? So I might just have some other, some other view of the matter. I might be a virtue theorist or you know, I might be amoral or something else. And so the interesting thing is that if we just look at the dilemmas where I'm killing one person to save five, we can't distinguish being a consequentialist from being neither a consequentialist nor bound by a prohibition not to kill. What we have to do then, of course, is to introduce some further dilemmas which involve varying the outcome. So 
Gavronsky and Conway call these congruent dilemmas. So in the incongruent dilemma, I have to decide whether or not to kill one person in order to save five lives. In the congruent dilemma, I have to decide whether to kill somebody in order to avoid setting off a paint bomb. Why is that a congruent dilemma? Well, it's congruent because both the utilitarian and the deontological responses now align. They're congruent with each other. So if I think about this from a consequentialist point of view, I should not kill a person in order to stop a paint bomb going off. Yes, it will be messy, but that doesn't justify the killing on almost any view here. Uh, and likewise, from a deontological view, the killing is an action which is prohibited. So now these things align. And what you notice here is that the combination of finding it unacceptable to kill in the congruent case, but acceptable to kill in the incongruent case, that distinguishes the utilitarian or consequentialist response from all of the other responses. We've now got in each row of the table a different pattern of responses. This is the essence of the process dissociation response. We look at sets of dilemmas which are as carefully matched as possible, except for the, the outcomes vary in such a way that we get different patterns of alignment or conflict between different ethical approaches, consequentialism, deontological and other, that generate different predictions about what we can do. And then using a nice little bit of Bayesian reasoning, we can work backwards from the choices that people actually make to estimate, either for individuals if we give them lots of dilemmas or populations, the probability that they'll give a consequentialist response and the probability that they will give a deontological response. And we can treat those as independent parameters. The nice thing about process dissociation is it allows us to separate those two things. All right, so that's my brief introduction to process dissociation. Please do hold that in mind because we're gonna come back and use process dissociation later. It's a super powerful thing. And you can see why here. Uh, so here's a case where we've got uh, no special cog cognitive load. Here's a case where we've increased cognitive load. And what we're seeing is that the parameter estimates for how likely it is that you will give a utilitarian response are greatly affected by cognitive load. The parameter is larger when you're not under cognitive load than when you are under cognitive load. By contrast, the parameter estimates for the rule-based response are unaffected. Wow, so now at last we can say something very cool. We can say this, cognitive load does not seem to influence how likely it is you are to be sensitive to the prohibition on killing. You seem to be just as sensitive to the prohibition on killing in either case. But it will affect how sensitive you are to that distal outcome, the saving of the five people through the action of killing. As cognitive load increases, you are less sensitive to the distal outcome. And that's exactly what our dual process theory together with the auxiliary assumption predicts. So Conway and Goronsky, finally here, we were just looking at them. These are providing us with some rather excellent evidence for the dual process theory, a bit more complicated to understand than the others, but it avoids assuming that consequentialism and deontological are the only two options, and it provides a way of looking at what happens as we vary the distal outcomes of actions. So that's a very nice result for us. Where are we in conclusion? I think we can conclude that although the picture is quite mixed, so Tremelier and Bonifon, I think are not clearly providing evidence which does support the dual process theory. They're providing evidence which raises some really interesting, intriguing questions. Overall, these three studies do indeed provide us with quite strong evidence for that dual process theory. So that's a Good start, I suppose. Um, we're quite keen now on the first premise of the loose reconstruction of Green's argument. The next thing we need to do then, if we'd carry on our evaluation, is to search out and find evidence that might count against our dual process theory. What you'll notice from Green's point and shoot paper is that he doesn't actually mention or discuss any such evidence. So we're gonna have to do some research by ourselves to find evidence against the dual process theory and evaluate that. Um, and so that's one of the things that will be coming up later. You will need, once again, your understanding of process dissociation for that. You don't need a massively technical understanding, but you need to understand roughly what's going on there. Well, that was fun. And that's really the end of this section. But while we've got 
this Conway and Goronsky study in our minds, you're up on the process dissociation. There's a kind of bonus finding that we can take away here, which relates back to Hübner et al's claim that there isn't evidence which can distinguish between the hypothesis that feelings alter moral judgments and the hypothesis, as they put it, that feelings merely motivate morally relevant action. So they suggest, look, there's lots of different ways in which feelings might be influencing things in a causal chain. It's not clear that they're influencing judgment. Can process dissociation help us here? I think Conway and Goronsky are maybe going to do that for us. That's not their target here, but it might be that what they're saying is relevant. So I want to see what you think. I want to see what you think about this. They say, um, so, so they have another study. This is study three that I haven't mentioned so far. I was only talking about study two until now. And if you're reading this paper, you can probably ignore study one. That's a correlational study that just sets the scene. So in their third study, they do something a bit different. Second study, if you remember, that was about manipulating cognitive load. Now what they're doing is trying to alter someone's feelings. Uh, so what they did was to have a group of people and they showed people a picture of the person who they were allegedly going to decide about killing. Um, the rationale, as they say, is that if you have show someone a photograph of a victim, you increase empathy and you create more emotional distress. So it's a much more emotional decision to decide to kill that person. Right. I guess it's much, much harder uh, to make this decision, even in a in the artificial setting. So how does this relate to our dual process theory? It doesn't. Our stripped down dual process theory, even with the auxiliary assumption, says nothing at all about feelings. It says nothing at all about feelings. So I don't think this does relate, strictly speaking, to our dual process theory. But much earlier in the course, in the first part of the course, we were interested in the effect heuristic and the idea that some aspects of judgment, moral judgment, may be a consequence of how things make you feel. So if we go back there, then one of the predictions that should follow is that higher empathy, more feelings for the victim, should increase the dominance of the less consequentialist process. That's to say, what, what should happen here is that there should be uh, perhaps less effect of the outcomes, a more effect of the prohibition on killing. And that is almost what Conway and Goronsky found. So what they found is this. It's actually a very beautiful finding, I think, that when you increase the feelings of empathy and uh, reluctance to kill, the way that you're doing that, so people do indeed kill less often when they've been shown the photo, but the way that's working, it's not making them less sensitive to whether or not you're saving a person or just stopping a paint bomb from going off, it's making you more sensitive to the prohibition on killing. So it's not reducing the probability that you will take into account consequences, but it is increasing the probability that you will be sensitive to the rule, uh, do not kill. So this is a nice finding, and it could be, I'm not saying that it does, I'm sort of leaving this with you to puzzle out for yourself. It's too difficult for me, you're the philosopher really here. Uh, I'm just sort of providing a bit of you know, look at this, do some philosophy, here's something. Uh, Hubner et al want to say, look, um, the emotion might affect the way that you interpret the scene, which then influences the judgment, so only indirectly. Um, I'm not too worried about that, because I think that really is a case of emotion influencing judgment. I can't really see a difference there. Um, the one I am worried about is this last one over here, uh, that I can't quite reach. They're saying that what happens is the judgment might do whatever the judgment does, and then the emotion goes on and just influences how that judgment influences your behavior. So now they're saying, in this case, emotion and feelings are merely motivating morally relevant action. It seems to me that Conway and Goronsky's finding that when you increase people's feelings of empathy for the victim, you make them more sensitive specifically to the prohibition on killing, but not necessarily any less interested in evaluating consequences. That does seem to me perhaps to speak against that possibility and in favor of the idea that emotion is directly or indirectly influencing the judgment. But as I say, I'm not sure about that. So I want to leave that with you as one last thing to puzzle out.